All right. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. If you're on Facebook Live, welcome. If you're on Zoom, we're glad you can make it. Um, today we're celebrating World Monitoring Day with Earth Echoes Solving Water Together Leadership for a Clean Water Future. My name is Avanya and I'm 19 years old. I'm a Earth Echo Water Challenge Ambassador and I'm coming to you live from Hawaii. Um, just a little bit about Earth Echo. Um, Earth Echo International is a nonprofit organization founded on the belief that you have the power to change our planet. Our programs and resources have reached more than 2 million people in 146 countries. This week, we are celebrating World Monitoring Day. Everyone can and should participate in the protection of their water resources. Today, we are so excited to have students from all over the globe joining us as we learn about exciting and sustainable careers in the water industry. Now, during today's event, you can send in questions for our panelists. Feel free to start typing questions in the Q&A if you're on Zoom or in the comments if you're tuning in on Facebook Live. We'll be sure to answer your questions as we go along. Today, virtu today's virtual event was inspired by the film Brave Blue World. This documentary seeks to paint a more optimistic picture of how humanity is adopting new technologies and innovations to rethink how we manage water. We hope you have had a chance to watch this amazing documentary. Before we begin, we want to thank our event sponsors, Xylem Watermark and Water Environment Federation. Now, let's get started by introducing our incredible panel. Let's start with Philippe Cousteau, founder of Earth Echo International. Philippe, can you tell us what you do and where you're joining us from? I think I was on mute. Um, sure thing, Vanya, how you doing? Uh, I know it's early for you over there in, in Hawaii, but uh, I, I'm, I doubt you're gonna get a lot of sympathy from people, frankly, because you are in Hawaii. Um, but uh, great to see you. And um, in fact, the last time we were together was in Hawaii, right? Am, am I right? We were filming Awesome Planet. And um, so uh, delighted to be here with you all this morning. It's such a, a wonderful day, such an important week and uh, celebrating water and, and solving water together. Um, as Vani said, my name is Philippe Gustav. I'm the founder of Earth Echo International. And, and as she also said, our focus is youth and education. And we've been around for about 15 years now, focused on that specific goal of how we build a youth strategy, a youth movement for the environment. And um, uh, Vanya is a great, and Angela, another uh, member of the panel here are great examples of, um, of the power that young people have to, to change the world. So I'm just delighted to be here um, and, and share some thoughts and, and learn and uh, have, a, have a delightful next 45 minutes, hour, who knows how long it's gonna go, but we're gonna have fun. So keep those questions coming in. We want those and um, yeah, let's get going. Awesome, thank you, Philippe. Next, we have Ifatayo Venner, Vice President of Archivists. Can you tell us what you do and where you're joining us from, Ifatayo? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm a Fatayo. I'm Venner. I'm, I actually am joining you from Tampa, Florida, but I'm an island girl at heart. I was born in Jamaica and I grew up in Barbados. So um, that's, that'll always be with me. Um, I'm an environmental engineer, um, mostly working um, in water, specifically wastewater. So I work for a large consulting firm, Mercatus, um, that works on built assets, natural and built assets, including water. And that's where um, I focus most of my work. I lead our wastewater service line, and I also do a lot of work helping um, our design and um, transportation or water and transportation teams and clients design their infrastructure more sustainably. And then I'm also the vice president elect of the Water Environment Federation that you mentioned is one of the sponsors of this week. Um, and, and WEF represents about 35,000 uh, water professionals around the world and 75 member associations really um, a lot of the folks bringing you a lot of your drinking water and your um, wastewater systems and storm water and all of all of that great stuff. That sounds amazing. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Gatanjali Rao. Can you tell us what you do, Gatanjali, and where you're joining us from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Katanjali. I'm 14. I'm a sophomore in high school and I'm tuning in from Denver. Um, a lot of my work revolves around using science and technology as a catalyst for social change, especially to solve real world problems that we see in society. 
So I'm really passionate about solving problems that impact people everywhere, basically, especially globally. Uh, one of my devices that have garnered recognition is Tethys, which is a device to detect lead contamination in drinking water at an early stage. And recently, I've expanded my work to educational outreach, working with teenagers who are also looking to make a difference in their community by running innovation workshops all over the world. Amazing, thank you. And lastly, we have Joe Vesey, the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Xylem. Joe, can you tell us what you do and where you're joining us from? Yes. Um, so, hey, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me and, and look forward to the discussion and questions and, and, um, and learning from others. Uh, um, that, that's for sure. So uh, I lead marketing for Xylem. Xylem is a water technology company. So we move water, we treat water, we test water, we meter water, and we digitally uh, enable uh, water infrastructure. And so that's Xylem in a nutshell. We mostly serve municipal customers, but we serve industrial and residential customers and, and commercial customers, but it's mostly municipal. So it's really big water um, that we uh, apply different products and technologies to uh, to help um, uh, help uh, communities use water in a more sustainable way. Um, so I lead marketing. I get involved in our sustainability efforts as well, which is really important to us. And we think about sustainability in a broader sense. Uh, I'm based in um, uh, I, the office is in Rybrook, New York, which is about an hour north of New York City. But like many of us, I have been working from my home, and that's where I'm at now, which is in uh, just north of Danbury, Connecticut, um, next to Candlewood Lake, actually. So it's great recreational, fun lake to kind of get on and explore. So that's where I'm uh, calling in from today. And it's great to be here. Thank you all for joining us. Your work sounds awesome. Now, if everyone's ready, we'll get started with our first question. So in the film Brave Blue World, Matt Damon says, how lucky are we that we're the ones who get to solve this? Philippe, can we start with you on what excites you the most right now about solving water? Is it a particular technology, innovation, or just a shift in thinking that you've had recently? Vanya, I, I can say without a doubt that what excites me most, and actually, you know, I don't think I answered your original question, which was I'm in Los Angeles right now. So uh, spending a lot of time indoors because of all the fires and, and the smoke and, and everything that's come down and affected us here. Um, but I, uh, uh, I'm really excited about, I think, the, the change in perception that the, the, the global water crisis is, is getting the attention that it deserves. Um, and in particular, water quality which of course is the focus of the Earth Echo Water Challenge because water scarcity, while water scarcity is, is an enormous problem around the world, water quality is also a big problem. And I think hasn't necessarily gotten the same attention um, historically that water scarcity has gotten. And so, you know, it, it, it's great to have access to water, but if that water is, is poison, it's not very helpful, quite the opposite. And we've seen that in a lot of communities. And I know Gitanjali has done such terrific, extraordinary work for so many years, looking at lead, for example, in, in water. Um, and, you know, of course, places like Flint, Michigan, got a lot of attention several years ago and, and continue to do so, and rightfully so, because of the lead that's that's been in that water. But, you know, research has shown that uh, communities here in California, for example, there are thousands of communities that have elevated levels of lead in the water. And a lot of people don't realize that, or PFOS, you know, other uh, uh, chemicals that are in our water. And a lot of people really don't recognize that, um, that, that their water quality might not be what they expect it to be here in the United States. That's the case all over the world. And the fact that there's an elevated concern for that and eleva elevated awareness um, is really, really important to combating this problem because it's insidious and it's scary because it's, it's the kind of silent, uh, slow um, uh, uh, detriment to your health and particularly your children's health. And I have a 15 month old daughter. And so we went through a lot of extensive testing here at the house on the water supply to make sure that we're unbeknownst to ourselves, you know, poisoning her. But that is happening in a lot of places. It's a scary thought. Um, and it's something that, that this movement is really uh, about enabling everybody to take control, take ownership of solving this problem. We can't expect others, municipalities and certainly governments and countries to fix it for us. We all need to be part of the solution. And that's what this is all about. The awareness of that is, 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 is skyrocketing. Um, that gives me a lot of hope in particular um, how many young people are engaged in this issue and fired up about this issue and, and wanting to solve this issue. And I think that's, that's really the key to the sustainable future uh, that we all uh, deserve. 
Awesome. Thank you, Philippe. Um, I agree. You do have a big part and we can all pitch in to solve water together and make everything safer. So leading into that, I'd like to hear, Gatanjali, what it's like to you most about solving water right now? Yeah, for sure. So I think the thing that excites me most, I'll probably have to agree with Philippe on this as well, is the idea that we're doing it now. Um, if that makes any sense, because water contamination is a problem that has been overlooked in the past, just the idea of clean water in general. But I'm glad that we're really taking the initiative to do something about it, um, including celebrities and influencers, as um, we saw in the documentary as well. So regarding my work with water, I've looked at chemical contaminants and now I'm moving to biocontaminants in water. Um, but really my solid goal has been to I guess, create a place where each and every one of us have the right to know what's in our water and then have access to clean drinking water. And I'm really glad that we're making pretty big strides towards clean water for everyone. Amazing, thank you, Gitanjali. Um, Next, can we hear from Ifatayo, please? Sure. Um, I think what excites me is that um, when, you, when you look at the film and Matt Damon says, how lucky are we that we're the ones to get to solve it? That's, that's essentially what I've been doing. Like a lot of the technology and um, things that you were seeing in the film are things I get to work on every day and I get to work with people who are doing those things every day. So it was nice to see it on film and to see other people um, getting, I guess the folks that I work with getting the attention I think that they deserve, but also other people becoming aware, more aware of the challenges, what people are doing, what needs to be done. So that's really exciting. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening in the field. Uh, I think when I started, it was a little bit more risk averse because what we do is so important for public and environmental health that sometimes you don't want to, you know, to step out with new technologies and so on. Uh, I think we're figuring out that that needs to happen to make it more efficient and to solve a lot of these challenges. And it can be done in a way that is still safe and reliable. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff happening. You know, we're not just looking at wastewater as something that is dirty that we need to treat and then dispose of. There's a lot of really valuable things in our wastewater. There's carbon, there's you know energy, there's nutrients. Um, there's water that we can basically recycle so that we can drink or use it for irrigation. So that is where the field is moving from, from just looking at, not just looking at it something to treat, but something to essentially recycle and, and recover. Um, so it's really fun. Um, and I get to every day contribute to like having a more resilient and sustainable world uh, with really, really great people. So. That sounds so amazing. Thank you. And last but not least, Joe, what excites you the most right now about solving water? Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, a lot, lot's been said. Uh, I guess what, you know, what I would just maybe try to add is, um, um, you know, uh, by solving water, uh, you also, because water, it just, it flows everywhere, right? So, so by solving water, we believe you could also solve other uh, social challenges, uh, equality challenges, gender uh, uh, equality challenges, um, access to water, pricing issues. If I go to a, a city in the United States, if I go to the, to the, you know, the more challenged economic area of that city, do they have the same access and price and quality of water that other parts of the city have? Um, so, it, you know, it, you can sort of start getting after some of the social issues which, you know, that, that excites me. So I, I like how that's been more coupled together. Um, love the fact, Philippe, and, but other, you know, big names are coming to water, right? And, and that's great. It, it helps get the, you know, the conversation and elevate the conversation on water. Um, we also see, we partner with uh, Water Boys, which is Chris Long. He's a former NFL player. He's got a, a water-focused uh, piece. Uh, we also partner with Manchester. We I, I love par our partnership with Earth Echo on water quality. That's for sure. It's one of our longer, longer partnerships. Um, but we've, we've uh, done something with Manchester City Football Club. And so um, that's a big soccer football franchise. And um, we uh, develop a lot of content. And, and we're, not, we're not selling anything. If you ever see any of our content, it's all about storytelling. And the last one was on the end of football. It was a film we just put out there. You can like uh, look it up on YouTube. You'll probably go to their channel. Their channel, I think it was about 2 million people 
So far, 10 million people have seen a three-minute film called The End of Football that we made with them. Uh, so just the reach and the engagement is wonderful. If you, there's like almost 3,000 comments of a United fan saying, I can't believe City did this, I love it, you know, or a Liverpool fan or someone else around the world saying, this is great, let's elevate. So I can see a lot more people getting involved, which is, which is quite helpful. And then last thing is, you know, technologies are here. You know, it's getting after either from a quality point of view, testing. Uh, my daughter and I are going to test Kendall Lake. She's got a science project. And we're going to do a, you know, testing in the water over the seasons and at different. So I see young people really coming in. We see it at Stockholm Junior Water Prize. The, the amount of talent. I, I was a chemical engineer. The world's much safer than I went into marketing than designing chemical or anything important plants. I can tell you that. Uh, so I sort of get technology. I'm amazed at what the Stockholm Junior Water Prize, uh, you know, so students, it's unbelievable. Uh, so the future is bright. Our job is to make sure they end up in water, right? You know, right? Because they're so talented, they can go so many places. So we got to kind of, you know, get them into water and we'll be set for a good time. Wow, that sounds so amazing. Thank you so much. And actually to tie in with this, um, we have two questions from Emily and, da and Haley at Davie County High School. They want to know, you know, when did people actually start realizing that water was a huge problem? I mean, you all mentioned great points that nowadays people are starting to change their perspective and their perception on this is an issue, but when do you think was the first time people really sat down and said, wow, this is a serious issue? And what do we do? What are our next steps if water becomes too expensive, if cleaning it becomes too expensive? Well, I'll jump in real quick. And historically, <clears throat> at least in the United States, there have been you know, periods of, uh, of, of water crises that have kind of woken people up. I think one of the biggest was when, um, though it happened several times over the course of the, the 20th century, but the Ohio River burned, the Cuyahoga River, excuse me, when it was on fire back in the 1960s. And, and um, that helped to galvanize people uh, around recognizing that a fire that is, uh, excuse me, a river that is water was burning like the river was burning. How is that possible? Oh, it's because we've been allowed all these industrial companies to dump all these chemicals into the water supply. Why not? Let's do that because it's better for industry and people can make more money. Um, and yet we realize, oops, uh, water's kind of important. And when rivers are on fire, that's not good for anybody. And so that, that, that was a galvanizing force and that helped to galvanize politics. And actually in a Republican administration, I think this is really ironic and important to point out, a Republican administration, President Nixon, um, is the one that passed the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act extension and a myriad of, he started the EPA, NOAA, Marine Mammal Protection Act, the list goes on. And that was at a time when the environment wasn't the same kind of politically polarizing issue that it is today. Um, uh, won't go into politics, that really started, you know, in the 80s under the Reagan administration. But nevertheless, uh, that, that was a, a, in many ways a better time politically, I think, from the perspective of the environment, because you could have, pol you know, political parties coming together. Um, so to answer the other part of your question, what can we do now? Well, unfortunately, even things like water quality have become politicized. Um, and the recent administration has reduced or eliminated a lot of protections for water uh, and water quality in this country and set us back decades. And so um, this is something that's, that's actually affecting people's lives and their health now and into the future. It has long-term consequences. Um, as we know, I'm sure uh, Gitanjali can speak to this a lot more than I can, but lead pollution, you know, causes neurological damage that stays with you for life. So young children exposed to these kinds of chemicals can be damaged uh, for life. Um, so it's a political issue, unfortunately, right now. And as a younger generation, we need to get out there and let our politicians of both political parties, like this is not against Republicans or Democrats. This is something that should be bringing us together politically, not dividing us. And so I think that the key is, is recognizing as a new generation of Republicans, Democrats, whatever, um, that, that we all should be fighting for water and strengthening protections for water, not weakening them and demanding that our politicians listen to us as a new generation that wants that uh, across the political spectrum. 
Thank you so much, Philippe. Um, Gitanjali, do you have, or Joe, if it's not, do any of you have anything to add um, with what you've noticed, either from your research or the area you grew up in, lived in? Anything? The only thing I would say, it's, it's um, I mean, I think Philippe hit on the, like the big, the big uh, sort of episode that a lot of people see, but it's also very personal. Um, you know, you know uh, the Stockholm Junior Water Prize winners from, they were from Singapore, and I want to say they won, say, four years ago, five years ago, something like this. They came to our office at the time, and they gave a presentation of their solution, and we said, you know, why did you kind of, what, what piqued your interest? And um, Blue Dog, Blue Dog. And the blue dog is they they're running around and having you know fun playing in, in wherever they were in Singapore, and um, they saw or, or this might have been actually in, uh, across the way in Malaysia. They but when they were playing there, they saw these blue dogs running around. And the issue was textile industry. Philippe was just getting to it. The textile industry in this case was dumping a ton of dye and ink into the river, and the river was totally turned color. And as the dogs went in the river, they they turn blue because that's what the river had from whatever dye, from whatever textile. And so all these blue dogs are running around. And they said, they, wow, we can't stand for that. And that's why they went in for a solution after um, water quality in this case. So it's, but that is like, you know, when we first heard it, it was goose, goosebumps when these kids were telling a story. And that, that will live with them for a long time. So I think in everyone's life, there's going to be this moment where you have a very personal sort of like change the moment. And for them, it's blue dog. And there's a lot of blue dog, you know, for everybody out there. And it's very emotional and personal. So a little bit on the opposite side of the example maybe that Philippe gave. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. Now we're going to move on to our next question. Um, this says, what can be done to inspire young people to take action as leaders and innovators to help solve the global water crisis? Um, Katanjali, can we start with you and kind of what inspired you to get into innovating and creating? Absolutely. So I think that harnessing like the uniqueness and the ingenuity of youth is it's definitely important towards the future of innovation. And you've heard this so often, but like out of the box ideas, um, especially with the global water crisis. So there's definitely a space for commercial research and when people are working on interesting problems. So my goal personally is to expand opportunities for young innovators beyond like, you know, a PhD program or uh, working at R&D lab. So while it took me a lot of effort to reach out to the right people for expertise and guidance, I do believe that organizations, companies, and universities were more than eager to support me in my journey. And I think that other young people would strongly benefit from such opportunities. For example, water organizations seeking young researchers is super important for not only their own personal research, but also for influencing lawmakers, as well as giving them that personal drive and motivation to keep going about the problems they want to solve. So while like, for example, with me, I would come in with an idea that I'm super passionate about. But you know, you almost immediately get shot down when someone who is older than you or at a higher social status than you tell you that, you know, your idea doesn't make sense because you're, you know, 11 or 12, we're not willing to support this right now. And while obviously that does make sense in some cases, I think if we start embracing that idea of yes and saying yes more often, involving those students in our labs, involving those students in, you know, even if it's just sitting into a like a office meeting. Just the small things really help out. And I can say that from personal experience too. And I'd say a lot of that is, is essentially how I got into water. I've been interested in, I mean, I'd say I, I grew up on a really small island. I spent a lot of time on the beach. Um, I was really interested from early on in environmental you know, issues. Um, you know, some days we didn't necessarily have, you know, when you turn on the tap, there isn't water that comes out all the time. Um, so I was aware of it, but I think the thing that really helped is um, when I would ask questions, um, a lot of adults took interest in it. Um, they, they answered my questions. I remember going one um, Easter to the Coastal Conservation Project Unit in Barbados and they, you know, they, they mentored me and, you know, said, answered my questions, which really, and showed what I could do to help. They didn't diminish, you know, even though I was young that I couldn't actually do anything to contribute. 
and that passion really stayed with me. Um, and I try to give that back, but I think that's, that's, that's really key. Um, you know, educating people on the water sector and the water issues, but how they can help and then mentoring them along, not really, you know, diminishing what they can do, even though they're young. Um, I think if people had not done that to, for me, when I started, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, and even though it seemed little to them, it was a big deal to me. So. Amazing. Thank you both for sharing. And um, we do have a few questions. So Jada from Davie County High School wants to know how the global water crisis is going to affect future jobs and goals in any career, really. Future jobs in water, I guess. Yeah, future jobs in water or how it ties into other industries that might not deal with water. How will it affect that? Or in maybe Katanjali's case, how would it affect your goals um, for possibly a business or a big project that you had planned? Well, maybe I might be able to throw some quick thoughts out there and maybe others can build from there. You know, I, I think um, it's going to be pervasive. Now, I, I don't think it's, it's the same as digital, right? A any, every business on earth is a digital business. So everyone is going to have to understand digital to some degree. I think this is, this is very close, but it's not talked about uh, all that often. Because I think, you know, more businesses are realizing that um, they are more dependent on water than they thought. And when you get into droughts like in Australia or in California or pick uh, uh, Germany, Berlin, or yeah, uh, the Rhine River uh, Valley, or go to the UK, when companies are doing this thing called force majeure, which says, I don't have enough water to run my plant. And my plant makes like iPhones, you know, and I need water to make these iPhones, but there's no water. So guess what? Customers, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't send the iPhones out anymore, or I can't send whatever I'm, and that is happening more and more and more. So boards who run companies and management teams, they are having a much more broader perspective that they didn't think they had to worry about water. They have to worry about water. Climate change is dramatically changing the water cycle, and that's dramatically changing droughts and flooding, but on this case, it's drought, lack of water, either from a quality point of view, which is what Philippe talked about, or a lack of water. Both problems give you water scarcity. And so they have to deal with it. So we see so many more companies trying to better understand their water supply chain and how consistent it is. And therefore they need water engineers and they need folks who know water, right? And you know, I went to Stockholm two years ago, folks from Facebook were sending their water czar who works for Facebook, right? Why would a water czar work for Facebook? Right. So more companies are seeing the importance of water. They need to then onboard more jobs in water. Uh, that's definitely going to happen more and more. And the second piece is for the core, you know, for the core industry itself. You know, Philippe called it 1968, uh, Cayuga caught on fire, 70 EPA, 72 Clean Water Act. So many engineers came into this industry in the mid 70s into early 80s. So many did because we were investing to build technology so we didn't pollute those waters. Well, many engineers are still here. From that point. And so there's going to be a huge transition of retirement. A workforce is going to turn over, not only in the United States, but around the world. So about half is the number, it's always kicked around a bit, half of the workforce in municipalities will retire. They're going to need new people to come in to those jobs. So those are some of the dynamics on within the industry and, and maybe outside the industry. I think it's a great place to be, great future ahead uh, for water. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. And we have one more question for Gitanjali specifically. Um, Steve from Facebook is asking, what types of jobs in the water space should young people be considering? Great question. Um, obviously, as a sophomore in high school, I don't really know where I want to go into yet. Um, but I can, from my personal experience, I like reaching out to especially um, it really depends on what you're focusing on. Right now I'm working on parasitic contaminants in water, which has been super fun. Um, so I'm working with the University of Colorado Denver with that, and that's just their cell biology lab. So it's not even a water lab per se. Um, with my chemical contaminants, when I was working with lead, um, metallic contaminants, uh, it was more of a, 
I worked with Denver Waters Water Quality Research Lab. So I guess it really depends on where you want to go with it. Like I like to say, you don't have to solve all of water um, when you're doing it in the beginning. So pick that one thing, go by what your passions drive you to do, because um, it really depends on what you would like to look at within the water field. There's opportunities for everyone. So whatever you like to do, whatever you're passionate about, then I suggest, um, you know, looking towards that specifically. Um, like I said, I don't really, I'm passionate about a lot of things right now. So i um, not sure if I want to go into business or water or something. Um, but I know that whatever I'm going to be doing, it's going to be, you know, helping other people as well as being something that I like to do. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. And if it's high, yeah, I would say um, there are so many different kinds of jobs in water. I think a lot of you know, the one common thing is that they're passionate about water. But I work with engineers, different types of engineers, scientists. Um, there's got to be folks who operate the facilities, um, fix the equipment that's in the facilities, that actually build and design the equipment, that they're just an infinite amount of jobs. I mean, communication specialists, people who do the billing for the water. Um, so it, you know, if, if you're passionate about water, I think it's finding what niche within that sector is interesting to you, but it's not necessarily just science. Um, and even within science, there's just a wide range. Um, as I said, in my company, you know, I might be an environmental engineer and I work in water, but I specialize in wastewater. There's folks who specialize in drinking water. There's folks who specialize in the pipes that are in the ground, taking water or wastewater back and forth and all of those different things. Because So there's just an infinite amount of possibilities of jobs in water um, that, you know, I would encourage everyone to explore. Very good point you both brought up. They're all interconnected in some way. It's just all about what do you specifically feel passionate about? Right. Um, so moving along, we do have another question. So what are the biggest challenges for the companies, in this case, Joe and Ipatayo, um, for the companies you work with and for society in general for tackling the global water crisis? Um, well, I think Joe alluded to one, which is again, the workforce. Um, you know, in the film, they talk a lot about, you know, the issues with water scarcity and all of that, that are technical um, challenges and solutions. And I think we're, we're definitely making a lot of headway there and then some really smart folks putting their mind to it. Um, but I think a couple of challenges that are not necessarily technically related, again, it's the workforce. There's a lot of folks um, in the water profession that are looking to retire in the next year. I think I've seen some statistics that even within the um, folks that operate our water utilities, about a third of them are set to retire within the next 10 years, right? So fulfilling that workforce is going to be really important, bringing them in. How do we um, get them mentored and growth so that they can sort of take on these challenges? Um, even within, you know, what I do engineering, getting more people to come into water and specifically focus um, on some of the challenges we have, that, that's a big challenge. I think um, investing um, because a lot of our infrastructure tends to be out of sight, um, you don't necessarily, you drive on roads all the time across bridges, you don't necessarily see all of the water infrastructure, um, and you don't realize sometimes what all goes into it. And um, a lot of our infrastructure is aging. Um, I think the ASC, American Society of Civil Engineers says that our water and wastewater, they gave our infrastructure a grade D. Um, we have pipes in the ground that are 80 years old, um, I think on average, almost about 50. Um, so just, just to get that into good shape so that you can safely and reliably continue to deliver water um, and treat water is probably gonna, I think they said around almost $5 trillion over the next 10 years, that's a lot of money. And so being able to get that investment in our infrastructure is really, really key. That's a big challenge um, because you also don't, you don't wanna make sure that rates are still affordable to people who can't afford it because water is such a, it's, it, it, I mean, water is life, right? It's important to life. So if you don't, you, you have to provide that service almost as a basic human right to folks, um, but yet someone has to pay for it. So where can you get this infrastructure from federal, state, local governments um, between rates? That is, I think that's one of the major challenges in our industry to continue to um, deliver our services effectively. 
you know, not too much to add there. I think that's pretty, pretty well covered. Uh, the only thing I, you know, the only thing I try to, you know, uh, extend is, um, you know, the, 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 the affordability issue is a real issue, the affordability for an individual, uh, but the affordability to get at all the needs of the, of the system. And I think, you know, you have that piece and then you have this thing uh, around trying to change the mindset. So we, we sometimes talk about this uh, South Bend, Indiana, South, South, South Bend, Indiana uh, needed to solve this thing called a combined sewer overflow, which means when you have, you know, stormwater and wastewater, it mixes together and the, and the plant can't take all the volume, then it, it actually gets diverted to a, a river. And unfortunately, it, it gets dumped in the river. And that's not good. That's not good for so many ways. Um, and the traditional way of, of about doing that, uh, solving that problem would be to probably build, uh, you know, big tunnels and, and other more traditional pieces. But if you apply to digital solutions, digital solutions actually can save, in, th in that case, they save, I want to say $500 million uh, in solving that problem. And so there's this, there's this change going on where we have these big challenges and there are emerging solutions that so many people need to go up, including ourselves, everyone, need to go up on the learning curve and in, in, in what's possible here. The faster we can go up in the learning curve and try curve, then we can really get after these problems that are sitting in front of us and uh, really tough to solve because, um, you know, there's just, it's just that it's not affordable to solve them uh, for communities to pay for that. So that's this dynamic that's happening uh, here. It might you might call it digital disruption. It's happening in many industries. Many industries are going through an industry change. And uh, that's, that's sort of the thing that's happening here in water. Uh, but I'm hopeful. At the end of the day, if there, we can really solve these problems, that we don't pollute that river I just talked about, that's every, the community's happier. You know, everyone in that case wins. Um, and so I think that's a, we'll have to see how that plays out. That's a big challenge that many folks are involved with. I think that's a really important point, Joe, that, that when you look down the value chain, <clears throat> the consequences of not cleaning water. I mean, we talk about the cost of, of upgrading, as Vitaio said, about uh, upgrading our infrastructure system. And yet what I think that, and I know what, what uh, uh, WEF and, and Zalem and all of you struggle with helping uh, individuals and, and, and politicians understand is that if we're not cleaning the water in these particular areas, what are the downstream impacts? And those could be five, 10, 20 X more expensive ultimately than fixing the problem to begin with. I mean, think about, for example, the Gulf of Mexico and the dead zone that exists in the Gulf of Mexico because of all the wastewater from agriculture that goes in the Mississippi River and flows down in there. And the impact that that has on those industries of fishing, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico and the health of the communities in the Gulf of Mexico. It's enormous when you have a dead zone twice the size of New Jersey um, that, that is killing everything within that area that can't swim out because there's, the, there's no oxygen. Um, so there are true costs as well, right? That in the ledger, when we start thinking about, oh, but if we only look at the cost in the same way that people talk about climate change, you know, it's gonna be $2 trillion annually to eliminate, get ourselves off of, uh, of, of fossil fuels. And yet, if you think about the fact that globally, we spend a trillion in subsidies for fossil fuels, and you start to look at the ledger, it starts to change the, the economics of it. So you make a really important point, Joe, for us all to remember that if you just look at the cost and you don't look at the benefit, um, missing out. And, and I know that's really what, what the, the hard work that WEF does, the terrific work that WEF does, and, and Zylem as well in advocating the governments to start thinking about it in that perspective and be like, not, it's not that we can't afford to fix water, we can't afford not to fix and solve water. And I think in some cases we've done this to ourselves. We don't talk about our work enough. We don't talk about it a lot. So a lot of times when folks hear about water and our water infrastructure and all of the things that have to be done is when something goes wrong. Um, and you don't necessarily hear about all the things that are going right or that what is, you know, is needed. Um, I think young kids hear about being a police officer and a firefighter really, really early on in their career. They do not hear about you know, becoming a wastewater operator or a water operator or any of these other water careers that are so important to public health and, and the environment and so on. So I think we are realizing that we need to, I think that was one of the reasons why I think both us and Dyla invested in a firm like, in a, in a film like Brave Blue World and are doing some of these other things to get that word out so that we can bring people into the sector, but educate people on what kinds of investments are needed and 
and all of that kind of thing. So we're, we're doing better, but I think a lot of it is self-inflicted self in a sense. Amazing points that you all brought up. Thank you so much. Now we do have a handful of questions coming in for the Q&A and we have Kathy Pearson says that her second to fifth grade students are involved with creating water quality awareness projects and developing ideas to solve water quality issues in the future. Is it possible to connect with any of you as mentors and their efforts to improve? I know there's Earth Echo. I know that Xylem has a diversity section. So is there any way that can like, connect any of you about your projects and your research? Well, certainly Earth Echo, our, uh, uh, Ivana, you're a Water Challenge ambassador. That's what we do. Um, and the Earth Echo Water Challenge and all the work at Earth Echo that's supported by uh, WEF and, and, and Xylem from the beginning. Um, and so, yes, please, you know, perhaps in the chat or after, if you've been in touch with our team at Earth Echo to, to, to register for this, uh, give us your contact information and, and someone from our team will connect with you. But uh, what other resources, I'm sure, uh, Gitanjali or Katayo Joe, what else exists out there? Yeah, I would say same for me. Um, I'll be happy to speak to folks. Um, I think, again, there's within WEF um, as a professional um, organization, there's a lot of people who are really passionate about that. Um, so if I'm not able to mentor folks or provide information, there's there's a lot of, you know, the 35,000 members and, and, and folks who associate that are, that are really passionate and all always looking for opportunities to share and mentor within their communities. We have a very vibrant students to young professionals um, committee um, and, and a lot of our member associations have them as well. And, and that's a lot of what they do. Um, reaching out to you know, high school, elementary school, college students and so on um, to, to help them with what they're doing and get the word out about water. So absolutely happy to help. And we do a lot of, uh, of similar work. Uh, our uh, organization is called Watermark. And Watermark, we have about 250 champions and 25 ambassadors. And they're employees of Xylem, but uh, they spend a lot of time volunteering. We actually want to pull, last year we had 10,000 of our 17,000 folks volunteer on a water-related project uh, uh, around the world. And we get measured on it, and it's a hard measurement by the CEO. He wants to see every single person volunteering in their communities. And, um, you know, when, when you don't hit the goal or, or you're not there, it, there are tough questions follow. So, and it's a good thing. We, we want to get back. And so uh, we allow our people to get back. We have policies that says take off time during work to go back into the community, teach about the water cycle or what have you. So um, Earth Echo is a great, you know, lo a, a way to reach us. You can reach us directly, send a note to me or go on our website, fill out a form that says, I need, you know, co a contact or a mentor or what have you. And we'd be glad to hook up, you know, some of our experts in the in wherever you might be at uh, on water quality issues or water issues in general. So we're always looking to do those, that kind of work. Yeah, and Susan, who runs the Earth Echo Water Challenge, I know is on this listening in. So um, I'm sure she can reach out to you afterwards as well if, if you don't want to share anything on chat. But uh, um, we will definitely connect. And in the wise words of Gitanjali, yes. Awesome, thank you. Um, so now our next question is for Katayo and Gitanjali. Um, why do you believe there aren't as many women portrayed or participating in STEM fields and how can this be changed? I can kick this one off. Um, I think personally it's very, it's variable, I would like to say. So attracting and retaining more women in the STEM workforce definitely will maximize innovation and creativity. It's just the idea of getting people in there. Um, scientists and engineers are working to solve some of the most difficult challenges at this time. Um, obviously, we're all sitting at home in the middle of a pandemic, as one example. So it's when women aren't involved in science or engineering, experiences, needs, and desires that are unique to women may be overlooked, which I think is one of the biggest reasons why they're not involved. Um, I have a story that I like to tell people that I saw in a documentary. Um, so airbags originally were created only for men. It was a workforce made up completely of men. So when they started being installed in early cars at that stage, uh, there were many women and children who um, were facing a lot of 
know, medical backlashes or injuries because of these airbags. And it took them a while to figure that, that out until they started bringing women into the workforce. They realized that these airbags weren't fit for the body of women, hence um, damaging their ribs and other bones and parts of their body, which is so crazy how something literally as simple as airbags is that barrier between life and death. So that's just one example of how women can change the workforce in a positive way, especially the STEM workforce. Um, regarding that question of how can this be changed, I think it's really important to show girls and females that girls in STEM is a thing or they can do it at a young age. Um, personally, I, I was not one who, like you could ask me about any STEM concept and be willing to answer it. I was totally on the artistic side of things. I played, I still play piano, I've been playing for about 11 years. And I was totally, I was like, I wanna draw, I wanna paint all day. Um, because I didn't think I could perform my own science experiments. I didn't think I could be in a research lab doing real world you know, work and solving problems that people face out there. And then I heard about people like Marie Curie, Ada Lovelace, people who, you know, defined STEM and females in STEM. I watched a Marie Curie documentary the other day, and it was amazing. You know, this these are the people who I heard about. And this was only in like fourth grade where I started realizing that, you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. I think just putting out more of that message out there creates such a big impact, even if we don't think it does. So um, even if it's as simple as a video on YouTube or um, like a little paragraph on the internet, anything can really push girls to make a difference in their community and be involved even when they think they can't. Yeah, I've been um, working on, I guess, uh, diversity um, and inclusion efforts with um, related to the water sector for the last few years now. Um, it's definitely a passion of mine. I think the Brookings Institute, maybe a couple of years now, put out a paper that said that only there are only 15% of the water sector is women. Um, in engineering, it's probably about 20% of women in engineering. So a lot of it, you know, something someone said to me sometime back when I started this was, you cannot be what you cannot see. And so really getting um, those who are there out there in the public so that, so that young girls can actually see the possibilities of some of these um, different um, STEM fields, I think is really important, exposing them to the subjects. Um, there are some stereotypes I think that still persist um, that say women can't do these fields. I even in college, and I had to think one family member basically said women don't belong in engineering, right? Um, and so we've got to get past that still. I mean, obviously there's still some work to do if there's only 15% in the sector that are women. Um, for me, uh, and I think this is part of it, um, my grandfather was a chemist and he had a PhD in chemistry and he was really passionate about um, folks in STEM, right? And STEM education. And from as early, young as I can remember, he would bring me chemistry sets and all this other stuff. So it never occurred to me that this was not something that I couldn't do. Um, I wanted to, you know, change the environment, improve the environment, do water stuff. And I felt like, you know, the chemistry and the biology and the things that I was learning and I found interesting really kind of culminated um, to allow me to solve these problems. But it just never occurred to me because I could, I saw what he, he was exposing me to these things. And I, there were a couple of my family members who were engineers. Um, and seeing that and seeing that role model, that, that was sort of a natural progression for me. And I think more um, young girls need to be exposed to that and have that if they don't have that in their family. It's folks like us, I think, who have a responsibility to be out there and mentor them and bring them along. Um, we, we still definitely have some work to do, but um, I, think, I think we are working on that challenge. Amazing, yeah. I I personally did not grow up with a lot of exposure to the animal and water world. It was more so something that I kind of got into a little bit later in life. So I do understand and I agree that there, do, there does need to be more exposure because, you know, some people it's kind of like seeing is believing. So if they never get to see what's going on and never get to really get that connection with the ocean and the marine life, they'll 
never truly understand it. So I do appreciate you both speaking about that. And I agree that it is very important. And, you know, women in STEM, it's amazing. Um, so we do have a question for Gitanjali specifically that ties in. Um, Emma is asking, do you find that your peers, others that are your age, are as informed about water issues as you'd like them to be? Um, she said that you spoke about the challenges of getting adults to listen as a young person, but what advice do you have for educating youth that are your age and helping them to understand what's going on? Great question. Um, I go to a STEM school, so my answer is going to end up being a little bit biased, but um, in sixth grade, I did go to a public school and I was much more interested in science and technology, especially that water sector than many of my other friends or um, people in school overall. So a lot of times this, I've really seen that this is because students don't know where to start. And I think it's really important to address that. I know all my friends have really seen my work and you know the, the most common question I get, which people tend to laugh at is how do you do it? And I don't know what it is. I don't know how to answer it. But then I realized that it's such a broad question because they don't know how to get more specific. And I was lucky enough to have resources like mentors, teachers, my parents who were able to guide me through that process. But it's really hard when you don't have those people backing you up. So one idea is um, to involve more students in learning more about water and taking action. You know, answer questions, answer questions mentor them, um, be someone that they can come back to once in a while. Um, and then for teachers and educators specifically, involve water in the curriculum. Much of the stuff that I learned about water was through school. Um, and that was the preliminary stuff. I ended up getting interested in it and taking it from there. And oh, students are at school basically for most of their life. So, you know, go after that. And if you're a teacher, then involve water in your curriculum in some way, and then involve more problem-based learning. How can we tackle water problems in society rather than worrying about, you know, here's your test next Monday, um, try to get an A on it. Um, there's much more that you can do to combine the aspects of real world problem solving in a school field, which not only gets students interested, but it also helps people take action within their own communities, knowing that wow, at an early age, I can make an impact too. Amazing, thank you, Gitanjali. And so we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, this question is for Philippe, specifically from Cooper in Washington State. And he said, what can people do at home that will help the most with the global water crisis? Well, Cooper, that's a great question. Uh, I'll say, uh, I know our time is running out here, but I just want to say that um, the most important thing is be informed. That's first and foremost. Uh, you know, Gitanjali uh, said it so well that there's access, there's information out there. And to understand the issues and understand what's happening is absolutely critical. Uh, and then from there, I think, you know, what are you interested in? Uh, how are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Um, you know, are you passionate about uh, communication, communications, talking to people? Are you passionate about doing science? Are you talking passionate about arts or writing or um, uh, the engineering or problem solving? Whatever it is, follow that passion. We actually have some resources at Earth Echo, um, some some guides that uh, guide people through guide designed to guide young people through figuring out what they're passionate about. Um, finding out what kind of resources they have in the, themselves and their families and their communities and designing projects that are, are relevant to them around helping to solve this problem. So really thinking about, um, um, you know, everybody's different, every community is different, uh, but, but finding how you can leverage your personal passion and tap that into solving problems. Um, I studied history at university. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a marine biologist. A lot of people assume I am because of my name and my background and the work that I do. Uh, but really, I'm a communicator and a storyteller. And I'm really at Earth Echo about providing platforms to expand and grow the audience of people that understand and, and care about these issues and, and take action to support them. Um, that's my that's my passion. I love telling story. I love the communication side. I'm not a scientist. And, and so no matter what you're interested in, if it is science, if it's communication, whatever it is, 
follow that passion and find a way to apply it to this work. Um, and, and in particular, uh, you heard me say it earlier, but we're coming up on a very important election. Um, and I think voting and getting involved in that process is absolutely critical. Again, not saying what party to vote for, just saying get involved in the process and demand that no matter what party you're, you're, you're affiliated with, or you wanna be, you wanna be supportive of, that you help everyone recognize that access to water is a fundamental right that every single person born on this planet should have. And no one has the right to diminish uh, uh, the quality of water uh, for their own benefit. And um, uh, I think that uh, that's something we as a, as a, and you as a new generation have to ensure you demand because the challenges and the pressures being put on water with the growing population, with growing industrialization, with climate change, uh, higher amounts of drought around the world is increasing uh, exponentially. And so what we do with that water, what we, how we take action now um, is going to be critical. So getting involved in the political process, um, supporting the right businesses uh, and companies that are, that are doing the right thing and, um, and being informed and getting engaged in your community. Thank you so much, Philippe. That was very insightful. And now, We'd like to once again thank all of our panelists and also Xylem Watermark and the Water Environment Federation. Um, and just a quick note, our, par our partners at Xylem are hosting a hackathon to solve water September 24th through the 27th, 2020, featuring webinars, prizes, mentorships, and so much more. High school students can register now through September 22nd, you can also scan that QR code. We yeah, this is a great example of like, of all the leadership Zion's provided, but please folks sign up for this, participate in this. This, these are the resources. This is our yes uh, to you all. Um, so absolutely, I can't stress enough how amazing Zion is and this work is and the hackathon is going to be. So please participate. Thank you so much, Philippe. And we hope that everyone, that you continue to celebrate World Water Monitoring Day this week and all year long. You can use these hashtags that we have here. Um, stay tuned to all of Earth Echo's channels to stay up to date on events throughout the year. You can access all of our free resources online. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and sign up for our newsletter at earthecho.org. On behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you so much for tuning in today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep exploring. Bye, mahalo. Thank you.